cognition. Okay, I've got that, it's recording, brilliant. So I'm gonna advance the slide. Like I said, Alison, if it doesn't work, tell me. So um, I first of all, just wanted to, to introduce you to the team of people that have been undertaking this work. So I can't take any of the credit. My PhD student, Maria Goodwin, has, uh, has, uh, has uh, completed a lot of this work under the supervision of myself and, uh, and their co-supervisor, Professor Eve Hoggevorst, and we're all part of the ACTING group, which stands for Applied Cognition, Technology and Interaction Group at Loughborough. And if any of you are interested in joining that group or any of the events that we hold, um, then please drop me an email. My email will be displayed at the end of, of the presentation. So um, what I want to say is if I, uh, whenever I refer to we or our research, it's not my own, it's uh, these guys as well. Now, if you thought this evening you were going to be a passive viewer uh, of the presentation, think again. Um, I've got a few interactivities for you to, to kind of get involved in, um, so I hope that's okay. Now, I'm going to use something called VBOX, which I use in my teaching. Um, if you'd like to join that, you can either go into your web browser and type vbox.app, and a window will be displayed, and the ID that you need to type in, the meeting ID is there on the screen for you. So it's 138 204685. So just to repeat that again, to give you a bit of a chance to, to do that, join VVOX via vvox.app via any web browser, any device. You can also download the app, but um, that might take a bit more time. And then the ID that you need, and I'll display it on every single slide, is 138 so I'm going to move on then. Hopefully, many of you will have been able to, to access that meeting. Um, but uh, like I said, don't panic. That meeting ID and the joining instructions are also at the top of this slide. So the first thing that I would like to ask is many windows open. I'm going to go back. Sorry, I've got three windows open and I'm not sure which one I'm clicking in. I'll just go back to that one. So go back. This is always, here we go. So joining instructions, let's go here. So I'm gonna start the poll now. So what I want to ask you all, and I want you to respond either yes or no, whether you know anybody who has a hearing loss. So I'm gonna open that now and press enter, and I'll give you 15 seconds to respond. That's great. So you can see some people already responding, that's amazing. And hopefully it will work really nicely. I think we managed to get seven responses in there. So brilliant. So, okay, uh, the majority of you, so about 87, 88% do know somebody, whereas only around 12, 13% don't know anybody that has a hearing loss. And actually, the, this doesn't surprise me uh, that most people know somebody who has, uh, has a hearing loss because hearing loss is really a global burden uh, of disease and it affects around 460 66 million people worldwide. Now, because of our aging population, this is expected to rise to 900 million by 2050. Uh, and just to put that into perspective, it's estimated that in the United Kingdom, specifically around one in five of the population have some kind of hearing loss. So it's highly likely that we're actually all know somebody who, uh, who experiences some degree of hearing impairment. Second question then, and this relates to the topic uh, that I'm gonna be talking about today. Now, compared to older adults without a hearing loss, how physically inactive or how less active are older adults with a hearing loss? So compared to those that don't have any hearing loss, the similar age, um, how physically inactive are those with a hearing loss? Now, if you think people with a hearing loss are 10% less active, I want you to choose that, off, uh, that option, 20% or 40% or 80%. So again, I'm gonna give you 15 seconds to respond. I'm gonna press enter now. managed to get eight out of eight responses there so that's perfect so we can see that some people have said 20 percent less active some people have said 40 and some people think even 80 percent so well done that's 62 and a half percent it is in fact 40 percent uh, less active so compared to age match controls or older adults that don't have a hearing loss older adults with hearing loss are estimated to be 40 percent less physically active now what does this mean? Uh, so what does this reduced physical activity in older adults with hearing loss mean and how um, does it impact their general, general health? 
So a recent study has shown that actually older adults with a hearing loss engage in around 30 minutes less physical activity each day. And what's really important is that this is found for individuals that do and do not use hearing aids. Um, and what this suggests really is that simply managing or treating hearing loss through using hearing aids doesn't address physical, um, uh, doesn't improve, sorry, physical activity in this population. Now, why is this problematic? Well, physical inactivity has a negative impact on these individuals' health, whereby older adults with hearing loss become older or more frail from a much earlier age. So it's estimated that it results in up to 10 years of accelerated aging, um, so they become much more frail, and also they're at, in, at an increased risk of developing what I call more life-threatening health conditions or non-communicable diseases. Um, now, these include things like diabetes, heart disease, and it's relatively well established now that hearing loss is associated with greater risk of developing dementia. Now, based on existing research, and this is mainly epidemiological based research, um, we've developed this conceptual framework, this diagram here, to show how all of these different factors might somehow be related. So how is it that hearing loss is related to uh, increased dementia risk, uh, increased cardiovascular disease risk, uh, as well as other psychosocial factors, such as things like social, social isolation, loneliness, and depression. Now, I don't want to dwell on this uh, this image for too long uh, because I probably could spend the whole presentation just trying to, to talk about this and trying to explain all of the evidence uh, that we've kind of combined together to form this. So the main take home message that I want you to take away is that existing evidence really paints a very complex picture. And our research that we've been doing has really been trying to untangle uh, this picture. So the remainder of today's presentation, I'm going to discuss or present to you some of the ongoing work that, that we've uh, either started to complete or is still somewhat ongoing. Now, this includes uh, several observational cross-sectional studies where, we were, where we're interested in one study assessing associations between hearing loss, physical activity and non-communicable disease risk, because surprisingly, these haven't all been studied uh, in one population as a whole. Um, I'll then also present the findings of a registered systematic review that we've completed, assessing the effectiveness of physical activity interventions in older adults with hearing loss. And then um, I'm going to discuss some findings from a qualitative uh, study, a semi-structured interview study, where we were interested in investigating the specific barriers and facilitators to physical activity in older adults. And together, this work uh, is informing the development of a novel uh, physical activity intervention in order to meet the complex healthcare needs of older adults with, uh, with hearing loss. So if I first turn to our, our cross-sectional study that we completed uh, last year, so as I mentioned, we were uh, interested in here in this study to investigate in one population associations between uh, hearing loss, physical activity and non-communicable disease risk. And we initially did this by an online survey, which ran between February and July of last year. So as you can see, this was right in the middle or just before and then during the first uh, COVID-19 related lockdown in the UK. Now, as part of uh, this study, we included validated self-report measures of all of these different things. So we included uh, validated measures of hearing difficulty, psychosocial factors such as things like resilience, depression, social isolation, um, physical activity, cardiovascular disease risk. Um, such as things like diabetes, hypertension, and so forth, as well as cognition. So our, our self-report measure here was uh, self-reported memory problems. So in total during this period, we recruited around 389 adults uh, with an average age of around 41 years, but they uh, range from 18 to 87. Most identified as female, uh, were white British and were highly educated. So there was a slight, a slight sampling bias there. Over half uh, uh, self-reported hearing difficulties, uh, and that was measured using um, the hearing handicap inventory. And around a third also reported memory problems and 20% uh, took part in sport. And that was our proxy measure for physical activity, just because we found that the compliance with our, our um, validated measure was, was poor. That was the IPAQ for those interested. Now, in addition to that initial study, we also supplemented uh, the self-report measure 
measures uh, with some behavioural measures in a subgroup of, uh, of participants, uh, 60 individuals. And again, due to the COVID-19 pandemic, this was completed entirely online by Microsoft Teams. So our behavioural measures here included um, a hearing loss a screening app, the Hear Who smartphone app, and if you're interested uh, in, uh, in accessing that, there's the, there's the QR code. And this has been extensively validated in the literature. Obviously, ideally, we would have liked to have used uh, a more gold standard measure of, of hearing loss, such as pure tone audiometry. But as I mentioned, this wasn't possible due to, due to uh, lockdown restrictions. Now, the Hear Who app, I have a demonstration for you here. And I do want to say, um, hopefully it won't be too loud. You may need to, to, to silence your, your, uh, your speakers. I'm just going to play it for you now. It's a triple digit speech and noise test. So you'll hear three digits and there'll be some hissing noise in the background. And this is actually me giving it a go myself that I recorded. So it should increase in difficulty as you go along. So I'm just gonna press play, bearing in mind that you may need to quickly uh, turn the sound down on your PC. So you should have heard some digits there and some... And that noise stays the same, but the digits get higher from the back. Anything. So it's kind of that thing for the correct. And then eventually at the very end, you get a score out of 100. Anything above 50 yep. suggests it's good hearing. Anything below 50 suggests that you might That's have true. a hearing difficulty. Sorry. No, it's a hearing who, hear who app. Sorry, Susan, I'm just going to mute you there. <laughs> Excellent. So, yeah, that was the Who, uh, Hear Who app, and it's available on Android and Apple uh, st uh, app stores. Now, in addition to, to that uh, hearing loss behavioural measure, we also had three measures of uh, cognition, which have also been validated screening measures of dementia and mild cognitive impairment. Now, this included the modified telephone interview for cognitive status, which specifically assesses episodic memory, working memory, attention and visual spatial processing efficacy, and that was presented auditorily. We also had a measure of, uh, of verbal learning, the Hopkins verbal learning task, and that was presented visually. And we also had a verbal fluency task, which measures, measures semantic memory and general executive functioning. Uh, and that really just required participants to name as many animals as they possibly could in, uh, in one minute. So what I'm going to do is present to you a very broad overview of our findings from across those studies. So I've got hearing difficulties in the middle of my, uh, of my diagram. And really what, we're, what I'm going to show you here is what was associated with, uh, with greater hearing difficulty or hearing loss. So what we found here is that those that reported, both uh, that self-reported and have greater hearing loss behaviourally, were more likely to be older, which is unsurprising because hearing loss is typically associated with increasing age. Uh, they also had a higher occupation and greater educational levels, which is probably a bias in our sample. Uh, we also found uh, that there were some lifestyle factors associated with greater hearing loss, including being a current smoker and also, interestingly, being less physically active. Uh, individuals with hearing difficulties were more likely to report dizziness, and they were also more likely to report memory problems and listening fatigue, as well as perform more poorly on some of our measures of cognition that I showed you earlier. In terms of psychosocial difficulties, individuals with hearing loss were more likely to report greater loneliness, social isolation, and, uh, and also lower resilience, which may be attributed to the communication difficulties that are associated with a hearing impairment. And lastly, we also, also found that hearing difficulties were associated with greater cardiovascular risk. So individuals more, were, that had a hearing difficulty were more likely to report stroke, higher BMI, body mass index, higher blood pressure, and, uh, and greater or poorer cholesterol levels. We also uh, split our sample by age. So we did a median split uh, and split them by younger and older adults. Uh, and uh, what we found here is uh, we tested the associations between our variables and we found that, uh, that hearing and memory problems, this association was present irrespective of age. So uh, irrespective of whether you were younger or older, if you reported a hearing difficulty, you also reported uh, memory 
problems. And what this might suggest is that hearing interventions may be necessary at any age in order to kind of tackle some of these memory difficulties. However, we did find some age specific uh, differences uh, where lower physical activity levels were associated with greater uh, hearing difficulties and memory problems, specifically in older adults, suggesting that this is a population that we might want to target for future intervention. So what this suggests is that we might want to promote physical activity specifically in older adults who have a hearing difficulty um, and it will, this, this might be especially important in order to reduce some of the non-communicable disease risks that have been shown such as cardiovascular disease and, uh, and dementia. So with that in mind, um, if we look at existing literature again, what we can see here is that a novel and potentially cost effective means of promoting physical activity, specifically in older adults, is through web based or digital interventions and that there's actually a growing vast array of evidence showing that these types of interventions um, are very effective, specifically in healthy older adults that live in the community. Now, if we look at previous systematic reviews, these interventions typically involve some form of activity tracking, such as step counting or work uh, walk time, uh, as well as some form of remote coaching and, uh, and social support. What's, what's really critical to my interest, however, is that none of these programmes are designed to meet the specific and complex healthcare needs of older adults with hearing loss. Now, why is this important? Well, um, this is important because older adults with hearing loss experience persistent communication difficulties um, that aren't completely cured or alleviated by hearing aids, and this can have a huge impact or a negative impact on their participation in group and outside activities, which is where sport and, uh, and exercise often take place. In addition, older adults with hearing loss are also more likely to experience other comorbidities that actually impact their fitness and, and physical functioning, um, suggesting that a more tailored approach for this group of individuals is, is necessary. So this is the last poll of today's uh, of, of, of my presentation today. And I just want to ask you very quickly whether you think web based physical activity interventions are a good solution for older adults with hearing loss. So if you think that they are, then you, I want you to rate it up to four or five stars. If you're not too sure, maybe three stars. And if you're like, no, web based solutions aren't, aren't appropriate for, for older adults with hearing loss, one or two stars. So I'll go, again, I'll give you 15 seconds to respond to that poll. I can see everyone's responded. Well done, everyone. So let's take a look here. So interesting. Okay, I've changed the order of my slides slightly. So I'm glad that this 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 result has happened. So we've got some people no way, not not a viable solution. Some people four stars, but most people somewhere in the middle, which means we have an average of around of around three. Now, what I want to argue is that actually what I've seen there is very common of some of the conversations that I've had with people in the past, and and, and often people are very concerned that web based uh, platforms are suitable for older adults, specifically those with hearing aids, because it's often assumed that this population isn't very digitally or technologically savvy. However, what I'd like to try and convince you of is that actually the, this group of individuals are becoming more and more savvy and actually more savvy uh, in comparison to any other age group. So if we look at the proportion of, uh, of older adults, um, so 75 plus years who are accessing the internet, this has nearly doubled uh, within the last uh, decade or so and at, the, at one of the fastest rates. So if we look at 2013, for instance, just under 30% of older adults uh, were using the internet regularly. And then by 2020, this has, uh, has increased exponentially. So around 55% were using the internet. And what I hope this is trying to convince you is that, uh, that web-based technologies are becoming more and more suitable for this population. Now, based on uh, the results uh, of our previous observational studies, uh, what we intend to do now is uh, to develop and evaluate uh, a physical activity digital intervention in older adults with hearing loss. And in order to achieve this, 
our research, our work is being underpinned by uh, the MRC framework for developing and evaluating complex healthcare interventions. Now I'm showing you the diagram here, and this is the process that we're going through at the moment. And I do want to uh, highlight that this actually has been updated recently in the last month or so, um, but I'm just showing you the, the older diagram. And I've highlighted that development phase because that's the one that I'm gonna be focusing on today. So as you can see from this diagram, there are several stages to this framework, uh, specifically in relation to intervention development and evaluation. And the arrows point in all different directions show you that actually progression from one stage to another isn't necessarily linear but can also be very iterative. So in stage one, this, uh, this refers to development where we're uh, identifying existing evidence. Um, these, uh, these studies can also be de kind of developmental studies that are either qualitative or quantitative in order to provide insights into how the healthcare intervention might operate and includes things like barriers to delivery. You can then move on to uh, evaluation of the developed intervention, looking at feasibility and piloting, say of a randomized control trial, then moving to a full scale evaluation, and then finally implementation and dissemination, which is about getting the, the evidence in, into practice. So in view of these, uh, these guidelines, I'm going to present you some, some of the findings that we've, uh, that we've obtained uh, that we, uh, for studies that we've undertaken specifically in relation to the development stage of this, this guidance. Now, in terms of identifying the existing evidence base, we've undertaken a systematic review where we were interested in assessing the effectiveness of physical activity interventions in adults with hearing loss. And what I'm showing you here is a table which shows our PICOs uh, inclusion criteria. And PICO stands for Participants, Interventions, Comparators, Outcomes and Study Designs. So we only included studies that, uh, that recruited adults with mild to moderate hearing losses. So this, uh, these are groups of individuals that would typically be prescribed hearing aids to address their hearing loss. We were uh, interested in any behaviour change intervention that aimed to increase physical activity, the comparator or the control group could be any, either no intervention or an alternative intervention. And our primary outcome was functional fitness, followed by a series of secondary outcomes. And we were interested in any kind of study design, whether retrospective or prospective studies, before and after studies, randomized control trials, non-randomized control trials, and so forth. Now, I'm just showing you these diagrams here because this shows you that we started from our initial searches and screening of various databases, which we undertook last year. We started with 3,705 potentially suitable records. And actually, after we applied those PICOs criteria shown on that table in the previous slide, we only ended up with two studies eligible for inclusion. Now, interestingly, both of these studies were randomized control trials where older adults with hearing loss were randomized to a physical fitness intervention, which was either aerobic or anaerobic, uh, and an active comparator. So in Jones's study published in BMJ Open, participants were randomly allocated to either group uh, hearing rehabilitation or group rehabilitation plus exercise and walking sessions. And in Bruce's study, uh, participants either went aerobic exercise and some form of cognitive training, which was either um, simultaneous to the exercise or sequential. Now, we were actually able to, uh, to pull some of the data together. So we did a meta-analysis because uh, both studies are used for similar outcomes. So if we look at our primary outcome, which is functional fitness, this was assessed via different means, uh, various different means in these studies, which included the chair sit to stand test, as well as the one foot balance time. And what we can see here is that uh, in terms of sit to stand, when we pulled the data across both studies, uh, we ended up with a significant result showing that in comparison to the control group, um, the, the result favored the intervention. So in this forest plot here, if uh, the markers are to the left, that shows that the intervention was having an effect versus the control. And if it was to the right, it would suggest that the control group was, uh, was driving the effect. And our diamond here doesn't go across the zero line being zero effect. So this suggests that actually physical activity interventions in adults with, with hearing loss can improve functional fitness.
However, the picture is a bit more complicated because if we supplement that with another functional fitness measure, the one foot balance test, we can see here that there's actually no difference. So you'll see here that all the points now overlap over that zero line, no effect line. So uh, certainly um, it's unclear. There's an unclear picture being painted from, the, uh, from, the, from those two studies when pulled together. If we look at secondary outcomes um, of these studies, we couldn't pull the data, we couldn't do a meta-analysis because only one study measured these. So if we look at Jones, for instance, um, they showed no significant differences for hearing specific health related quality of life, general health related quality of life or psychosocial well-being. And Bruce et al's study showed no effect of cognition either. Now, in addition to this, the available evidence was shown to be very low quality and subject to bias due to the study designs that were used. Uh, and uh, overall, what we conclude here is that actually further high quality research is needed to determine whether these physical activity interventions are effect effective in this population. Now, to supplement uh, our findings from the existing literature, we've also wanted to identify barriers and facilitators to physical activity uh, in, uh, in this population to inform intervention development. And in order to do that, we did a qualitative semi-structured interview study, which was underpinned by a model of behavior change, the COMBI model, which I'm showing you here. Now, very quickly, this model basically states that in order to do a desired target behavior, so in this case, physical activity, individuals need uh, psychological and physical uh, capability uh, to enact that behavior. So that refers to knowledge and skills. They also need physical and social opportunity. So their environment needs to be able to facilitate that behavior, as well as motivation, which relates to things like emotions uh, and habit formation and so forth. Now, the reason that we've adopted this specific framework is because it forms the central component to something called the behavior change wheel, which is then used in order to inform the development and evaluation of, of complex healthcare interventions. So if we look at our qualitative findings, then our interview findings, our initial thematic analysis suggests that there are several hearing specific barriers to physical activity in this population, and they mainly focus on psychological capability as well as physical and social opportunity. So if we look at physical opportunity, uh, no, sorry, physical um, uh, capability to begin with, a theme that emerged was that that we have termed cognitive fatigue. So for example, one individual uh, commenting, uh, they were discussing playing badminton. They said, you've got several people shouting from all over the place and it's trying to separate all the noise sources. And I find it very mentally draining. So there's that communication difficulty that acts as a barrier to physical activity. If we now look at physical opportunity, hearing aid use interestingly was seen as a barrier and a facilitator. Uh, in terms of a barrier, it was often seen um, uh, problematic due to concerns related to cleanliness uh, uh, and sweating. So somebody said here that they tend not to use their hearing aids when doing physical activity uh, because they become hot and sweaty and therefore cleanliness is a concern. Moving on to social opportunity, this included several themes, uh, such as those related to perceived stigma. So uh, they don't want to appear stupid, which is why they don't do uh, physical activity. And they were also concerned about things like alienation, uh, with one person saying they don't want to appear different, they don't want to appear disabled to other people. Now, as I mentioned, these themes can then slot into a much bigger framework, the behaviour change will, where we can identify suitable behaviour change techniques that could then be incorporated into an intervention to address those, those barriers. And that's certainly the next step. And this is kind of demonstrated to you on the, uh, on the table here. So what we've got here is we've got the theme that we identified, cognitive fatigue, where that fits within the COMB model. Um, it can also relate to something called the theoretical domains framework. Uh, so in this case, memory, attention and decision processes. And then based on identifying those mechanisms of action that can, uh, that can target that behavior, you can identify by suitable intervention functions to incorporate into uh, the intervention. So things like training, environmental structuring and enablement. And I'm giving you some ideas of potential strategies as well as some behavioral change techniques such as instruction on how to perform the behavior and, uh, and action planning. So into the future then, so 
The next stage of our research really then is to develop a digital intervention, physical activity intervention, that really addresses the complex healthcare needs of older adults with hearing loss. And I'm giving you some kind of flavour of what that might look like. So it could involve some online home-based exercise classes that demonstrate and coach older adults with hearing loss to take part in physical activity. Something similar to YouTube maybe, I know that I was doing that during lockdown. And these could be targeted at all abilities and intensities, and I'm showing you some examples there on the slide. Now, given um, the, the diverse needs of this group, it could include some on-demand and live content, uh, you know, in order to improve social inclusion, reduce social isolation, as well as incorporate activity tracking via an off-the-shelf wearable, such as a Fitbit or Apple Watch, in order to improve uh, motivation. So uh, to conclude then, uh, my intention today has really been trying to convince you that the development of an intervention specifically aimed at older adults with hearing loss is a viable solution in order to improve their levels of physical activity. Now, such an intervention should be tailored to address this population's complex healthcare needs, uh, including the communication difficulties they experience, which leads to greater social isolation and loneliness, to address levels of poorer cognition, uh, as well as the development of other non-communicable disease risk factors, such as dementia and cardiovascular ill health, which may actually ultimately limit their ability to undertake more vigorous physical activities. Now, in addition, our intervention uh, should aim to address the multiple barriers, the hearing specific barriers that prevent older adults with hearing loss taking part in physical activity to ensure that their needs and desires are met. And, uh, and really our plan development and evaluation work will, uh, will begin to address that need that we identified from the systematic review, uh, that high quality evidence assessing clinical and cost effectiveness is, uh, is needed when we're looking at interventions to improve physical activity in older adults with hearing loss. So I've gone over slightly, I apologize, Christian, but what I want to do is I want to thank you all for your attention today. Um, I do have to credit my son, Jared, for some of the images that I've shown. And if you have any follow-up questions uh, in regards to anything that I've spoken about today, uh, then there's my email address uh, for you, um, d.w.maven at lborough.ac.uk. So thank you. Thank you very much, David. Much appreciated. Really interesting talk. Um, we will be looking at uh, questions probably at the end of um, Christian's presentation. But thank you. Stay with us, everybody. And I'll pass you over to uh, Christian for his talk now. Thank you. OK. Evening. I'm just trying to help the start of perfect. Okay. Um, now, thank you for joining my this in a cognitive assessment, an issue that I think should be of interest to everyone working in the healthcare sector and whose task is to evaluate cognitive functioning in patients. Uh, by the end of the presentation, you should be able to answer the question if there is a risk that the use of some cognitive tests might result in an underestimation of a person's cognitive abilities. Now, an alternative question to are we over-diagnosing uh, cognitive decline could be the deafer, the dumber. While this uh, provocative title does obviously not represent my personal belief, it uh, nicely illustrates the erroneous conclusion one might reach when not taking into account the possibility that sensory impairments impact cognitive test performance. Now, it is likely that you in your role as a healthcare professional um, have already experienced situations in which auditory factors influence your or your patient's behavior. With the COVID-19 pandemic, the use of personal protective equipment has become mandatory, and there has been a keen interest in the impact of face coverings, for example, on the healthcare provider, on the patient, and also on the interaction between these two. Um, now, some studies have looked at the physiological and psychological impact uh, of wearing a face covering on the person who is wearing the face covering. Others have studied 
the communication issues between the healthcare provider and the patients, for example, in terms, terms of reduced quality of care or medication errors, and still others have looked at problems um, with the understanding of test instructions and test stimuli, so for example, during a cognitive assessment. And the remainder of this presentation will focus on this uh, latter aspect. Now, the question of the impact of wearing face covering is actually part of a larger issue that existed prior to the COVID-19 pandemic, and that is the impact of sensory factors on cognitive test performance. And in my presentation, I will be focusing on auditory factors, even though similar conclusions can probably be drawn for the visual domain. Now, you might be wondering why this issue is arising now and why it has become a talking point amongst researchers and healthcare professionals. So over the past decades, there has been a growing interest in the role of individual differences in cognitive functioning in complex everyday behaviors. For example, in my research field of hearing science, cognition is nowadays frequently associated um, or frequently used to explain speech and language processing. And this is reflected by a noticeable increase in the number of scientific publications investigating this particular relationship, but also um, the emergence of a new interdisciplinary field coined cognitive hearing science um, that is looking at the interplay between audition and cognition. In audiology, um, there's actually currently an active debate about the possible widening of the responsibilities of the audiologist, for example, to include the assessment of the patient's cognitive function. And for instance, the American Speech, Language and Hearing Association um, uh, advocates in their recently updated scope of practice in audiology document that in addition to audiological diagnostic measures, screening measures uh, of mental health and cognitive impairment should be used to assess, to treat, and to refer the patient, and that audiological outcomes need to be interpreted in the light of the patient's cognitive status, and that in the longer run, audiological diagnostic measures should be modified based on the cognitive abilities of the individuals being assessed. So you can see that um, kind of cognition and its assessment is kind of omnipresent. Now, given the central role of cognition and the apparent willingness of um, healthcare professionals to use cognitive tests, you might wonder what the issue is with cognitive testing. Here is uh, the problem. Most cognitive tests, tests require the administrator to provide verbal instructions to the person who's being assessed, and a substantial number of cognitive tests use at least some test stimuli that are auditorily presented, either verbally by the test administrator or as an audio recording. For example, here's an excerpt uh, from one of the most widely used cognitive screening tests, the Minimental State Examination, or MMSE. And as you can read for yourself, hopefully here uh, in this item, the test administrator is required to name three objects and then uh, ask the patient to repeat back their, the names. So here we have both the instructions and the test items being presented verbally. Now, uh, your guess is as good as mine as for the reasons for using an auditory format for a cognitive test. I suppose uh, that this choice makes the test more convenient and universally usable as no equipment or support is required for its administration. However, it is obvious um, that the use of an auditory format could present a challenge for people with hearing loss and thus disadvantage them on a given cognitive task. Now, I assume that most of you are not working in ENT or in audiology, and hence your patients, the patients you're seeing, are not uh, reporting any problems with their hearing. However, that does not mean that your patients have normal hearing. And to illustrate this, I'm, I've plotted uh, this graph here that is showing uh, a family of uh, age-typical audiograms 
for the general population, so your patients. The audiogram, which is currently still the gold standard for the assessment of hearing health, um, relates a, per a, person, a person's absolute threshold here um, for a given pure tone to the tone's frequency. And so what we have here is better sensitivity is plotted towards the top of the figure. And as you can see, there's a decline uh, in hearing sensitivity with age, especially in the high frequency range here. And what this means is that most of your older patients, even though they might not have received an official diagnosis of being hearing impaired, will actually experience some form of hearing loss. So what I'm telling you in this presentation concerns, or this probably concerns you too. So when researchers or clinicians are made aware of this potential bias, the sensory bias uh, during a cognitive assessment, the following justifications that you can see here are often uh, provided in defense. So for example, that the patient judged the volume as completely adequate, or that the patient even could adjust the volume, or that the patient was wearing his or her hearing aids. Now, as we'll see later in the presentation, providing amplification to ensure audibility of the test items might not mitigate the difficulties experienced by hearing impaired listeners during a cognitive assessment. Now, previous research actually has looked into the possible impact of hearing loss on cognitive performance. For example, this study by the Puy et al. from 2015, in which a large number of older healthy participants were recruited, and they were divided into normal hearing and hearing impaired listeners based on their audiogram, and then they were administered the MOCA, the Montreal Cognitive Assessment, and uh, a score of 26 or higher was considered as a normal cognition. And what I would like to look at now are the results of this study, and in particular, these two uh, columns here, this bars here, uh, that show that the proportion of the participants considered to have normal cognition was much higher in the normal hearing group, so almost 70% here, compared to the proportion of participants with normal cognition in the hearing loss group, about 40%. So the authors of the study took this as evidence that hearing loss has an impact on cognitive performance. Unfortunately, there are some limitations to the conclusions that can be drawn from the study due to the use of older normal hearing and older hearing impaired participants. And I will explain now a little bit more why that is. Now, like the authors of the study I just mentioned, you might think that the assumption that hearing loss has an effect on cognitive test performance can be easily tested uh, by administering, administering the same cognitive tests. So for example, a very simple memory task of the uh, digit sequence to a normal hearing person and to a hearing impaired person and then to compare the results with these two um, uh, test persons. Um, if the hearing loss affects how the stimuli are perceived during the test administration, then cognitive performance should get worse because of the distorted information that's being sent from the ear to the brain. There's kind of a knock-on effect. The sensory organ is not working properly, hence we can't do the cognitive task properly. And this uh, is referred to as the information degradation hypothesis. However, since many of these older uh, hearing impaired people actually acquired the hearing loss many years ago, it is likely that over time, the brain itself has adapted to the hearing loss and that those uh, brain changes have an additional deleterious effect on cognitive performance. And this is referred to as the sensory deprivation hypothesis. And so you can see that in older hearing impaired listeners, we actually have these two possibilities coexist. So it's hard to what actually happened to the hearing impaired listeners. Is their lower cognitive score due to uh, 
information degradation or sensory deprivation or the two. One way to disentangle um, these two effects is uh, to simulate hearing loss in normal hearing participants. In other words, to make normal hearing listeners momentarily hearing impaired. And so in this case, uh, the normal hearing listener would listen to the sequence, of, uh, digit sequences once unprocessed through the normal ear. And then again, after processing the sequence, listening to the, this pro, these process stimuli through their normal ears, and then to compare those results. And in the remainder of the presentation, I will discuss three experimental studies that investigated the impact of auditory factors on cognitive test performance. In the first study, uh, we used uh, an impairment simulation approach in normal hearing participants, similar to the one that I just described, to assess the acute, that is the immediate impact of hearing loss during test administration on cognitive test performance. For the study, we recruited 56 young students that were randomly assigned to one of two listening conditions, normal hearing, an age condition, and a simulated hearing loss condition, SHL. Each of these participants then completed three cognitive tasks, a forward digit span, a backward digit span, and a listening span task. I will say a little bit more about these different cognitive tests in the next slides. And for the listeners in the simulated hearing loss condition, we also assess intelligibility of the test stimuli after the administration of the cognitive test. So what we did here is we presented the, the stimuli, the test stimuli, for example, the digits, once again to the participants, uh, but not for memory purposes, but this time the participant only had to echo back, had to repeat what he or she had heard. Now, the, one of the cognitive tasks we used was a forward digit span test, um, that is a, a test that contains sequences of digits of increasing length that have to be uh, recalled after being heard. So you might hear three, four, eight, and then you report back three, four, eight. And this particular task is uh, considered to probe short-term memory capacity. The digit span test, the backward digit span test, um, uses the same type of sequence digit sequences, but this time the recall has to be done in reverse order. So you might hear 596 and you report back 695. Because of this reordering element, this test is considered by some people uh, as probing short-term memory, but also working memory capacity. Finally, we used a so-called listening span test that was inspired by the more well-known reading span test. And in our task, listeners were presented with short, grammatically correct sentences, and they had to judge the plausibility of the sentences. And a certain number of sentences, the task was stopped, and the participant was invited to recall either the first or the last words of each of the heard sentences. So for example, you might hear the boy jump far, and you would say, yes, that makes sense. The fish drove the car, no, that doesn't make sense. The rocket went up, yes, that makes sense. And then you're being prompted to recall the first nouns of the uh, sentences, and you would say boy, fish, and rocket. And because of this combination of the memory component and the processing component, the listening span task is considered to probe working memory capacity. Now, as I said earlier on, our participants were allocated to one of two conditions. Those in the normal hearing condition listened to the recordings of those uh, stimuli that were unprocessed and presented over headphones at a comfortable uh, level of 70 dB SPL. In the simulated hearing loss condition, the listeners listened to the recorded stimuli after processing them through an algorithm uh, to simulate some of the perceptual consequences of age-related hearing loss. And these consequences included, for example, an elevation of hearing threshold, so everything becomes quieter, 
but also reduced frequency selectivity and loudness recruitment. And these two actually distort the signal. So we have a reduction in the, in the loudness, if you want to, but also distortion of the stimuli. And our hearing loss simulator took uh, audiometric thresholds as an input, and I'll say a little bit more about this in the next slide. The process stimuli in, uh, for the simulated hearing loss condition were presented at the same volume settings as uh, used in the non-hearing condition because we have these, uh, this reduction in, in, in loudness of the stimuli, the stimuli were quieter in the simulated hearing loss condition. Now here on the left, I'm showing you the audiogram here, magenta, that was used for the hearing loss simulation. And this audiogram, which was taken from epidemiological data, uh, is typical for uh, a 75-year-old listener. You can see again, so what we have here is a high-frequency sloping hearing loss. This was fed to the, the algorithm, and then the different speech stimuli were processed. And here on the right, I'm showing you the spectrum for one of these stimuli, the digit seven, once unprocessed, and you can see it contains kind of energy even in the high frequency range here. And then after processing it, processing it through the hearing loss simulator, you can see we see a loss of energy in the high frequency range, especially. Now here, I'm showing you the results of this study for the three different cognitive uh, tasks. I'm plotting performance in Z scores with better performance towards the top for the normal hearing and the listeners in the simulated hearing loss condition. And you can immediately see that the normal hearing group always outperformed the listeners in the simulated hearing loss group. And this uh, group difference was significant in all three cases. We also found that the size of the difference, the effect size, actually increased with increasing complexity of the cognitive test. So from the more the simpler forward digit span test to the uh, more complex listening span test. I also said early on that we looked at the intelligibility, the audibility of the test stimuli. So did people, did our participants actually hear the test stimuli? Otherwise they would not be able to memorize them. And what we found is that for the digit span task, uh, digit intelligibility was always perfect, even for the simulated hearing loss condition, which means that the uh, difference, the group difference that were observed in these two tasks was not due to the fact that those listeners in the simulated hearing loss condition could not hear the, 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 the digits, but something else must have happened, something at the super through, uh, uh, threshold level. Now, in the listening span condition, we found that some of our participants were unable to hear all the words that were used in the listening span task. And so we reconducted the statistical analysis, uh, excluding this time all those listeners who did not have perfect intelligibility. And we found that uh, here shown by this open symbol that the results were virtually the same. So Again, here, even though intelligibility was uh, perfect in our two groups, and um, we found a significant group difference on this particular memory. Patients are interesting. They do not really concern you directly as you're not using these specific memory tasks in your own work. And um, so indeed, it would be helpful to know if hearing loss also has a negative impact on test performance for more widely administered cognitive screens, such as, for example, the Montreal Cognitive Assessment or the Minimal State Examination. And in these screening tests, um, uh, there's a wider range of cognitive abilities that is probed, so not only memory functions, and only some of the stimuli are presented auditorily. However, in general, the test instructions are spoken by the test administrator. For example, as you can see here for the MMSE, participants are 
asked to position themselves in time and in space. They're asked to repeat a sentence that's read to them, and they're asked to uh, reproduce a line drawing on a piece of paper. So there seems to be less of an opportunity for hearing loss to impact test performance uh, in this type of cognitive test. To test this, the hypothesis that hearing loss also impacts performance on such general cognitive screens, the entire MMSE, so that is instructions and the auditory test items were recorded and presented to 182 uh, young normally hearing university students um, who were all um, screened for non-cognition. And then participants were randomly assigned to one of seven listening conditions, either the normal hearing condition in which the stimuli were not processed. And then we had two simulated hearing loss conditions, one for an 85-year-old and one for a 95-year-old. And within these two simulated hearing loss conditions, we explored the additional effects of wearing a face cover. So in one condition, we didn't do any extra processing, and this was the no mass condition. And in two other conditions, we added additional attenuation. So the, the, the stimuli were even quieter than in the simulated hearing loss condition. And this attenuation was greater for the face shield than for the surgical mask. All our participants then completed in their condition the minimal state examination. And what we found is that performance on the MMSE, that's plotted here, did indeed decline with increasing simulated hearing loss. And performance in the most severe uh, simulated hearing loss condition approached actually the cutoff uh, value that is indicated to signal cognitive impairment. Now, interestingly, when um, in addition to the effect of a hearing loss, the effect of wearing a face covering by the test administrator was also simulated. The results showed that while a surgical mask did not impact on MMSE scores, compare these two bars here and here, the use of a face shield actually did significantly reduce test performance. And what's worrying is in this condition in here that we're now falling and significantly below the cutoff uh, value. Now, the final piece of evidence for the existence of a link between hearing loss and cognitive test performance comes from a study in which hearing loss was not simulated, but was, was real. And more specifically, the participants um, had a so-called unilateral hearing loss, which is, uh, corresponds to a rare case in which a person has normal hearing in one ear, so here, and a hearing loss in the other, so an impaired ear. And this allows to obtain from the same person, that is from the same brain, the same cognitive brain, cognitive performance and cognitive performance in the presence of the hearing loss. And these performances then can be compared. Consistent with the findings from the uh, two previous studies, we observed that cognitive performance here again uh, on a digit span test was sorry, significantly um, better when the testimony were presented to the normal ear than when they were presented to the uh, impaired ear. For some of the participants, this reduction in cognitive test performance was not associated with the audibility of the digits, so they could hear. Uh, all digits perfectly well uh, in both ears, but a few participants were indeed unable to hear all the testing. So there's also a problem of audibility. Now, uh, to summarize the presentation, uh, I pointed out that many of the currently used cognitive tests require the test administrator to provide oral test instructions, and at least some of these tests also use auditory test stimuli. The three studies I presented during my talk provided converging evidence that hearing loss does indeed have a deleterious effect on cognitive test performance. And this observation 
can be explained either by the inaudibility of the instructions and or the test stimuli, but it is also consistent with the so-called effortful hypothesis that is based on the notion of a limited pool of cognitive resources. So under optimal conditions, when we do a cognitive task and we receive verbal instructions and listen to auditory test stimuli, so when everything is quiet and our auditory system is normal, um, all the uh, cognitive resources uh, can be used uh, and can be allocated to the cognitive task. And this is sufficient to do well this particular task. While in suboptimal conditions, that is in the presence of a background noise, for example, or uh, when the test person has a hearing loss or the test administrator wears a face shield, and um, the early stages of speech processing require additional efforts. And this will reduce the amount of the remaining uh, cognitive resources available for the completion of the cognitive task itself. And therefore, we observe lower cognitive performance in this case. Now, in conclusion, caution needs to be exercised, exercised uh, when interpreting cognitive test scores from persons with hearing loss or when the test administrator wears a face covering, as it is possible that the results underestimate the patient's true cognitive ability, which in the worst case could result in a misdiagnosis of cognitive pathology. It is important to remember that the provision of amplification, for example, by simply speaking up when you talk to your patient or by letting your patient wear a hearing aid might actually not improve cognitive performance as intelligibility of the test stimuli is not necessarily the issue as I showed in some of the previous studies. Now at first sight, the design of visual versions of cognitive tests seems to be a possible solution, but it's likely that older patients also suffer from visual impairments, such as age-related macular degeneration. And so all we're doing is just shifting the problem from one sensory uh, modality to another sensory modality. Finally, uh, it is reasonable to assume that cognitive test performance is also biased uh, by sensory factors when providing remote healthcare, for example, over the phone, which degrades the acoustic signal. So we should be aware 